Uh, greetings. So this is part two of my after action reports for our Dawn's Hope game. And so this week sees, this this episode sees our uh, PCs in their caravan finishing the two-week trip across the Gap in the Teeth Mountains and arriving in the valley and in Dawn's, Dawn's Hope. Um, to remind you, Dawn's Hope is a walled town, effectively a fort for all, uh, for all intents and purposes. It has uh, 200-ish people living and working and about 110, 100 farming families sort of uh, uh, feeding those people in the surrounding area. Um, the current caravan adds a bunch of folks to that as well. A hundred-ish plus, uh, maybe 175. It's it's somewhere in that range, and about 15 to 20 new farming families uh, coming to 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 help out. Um, we'll get deeper into sort of the management mini game and sort of the numbers in Dawn's Hope specifically later on when it actually matters to the the story. For now, it's enough to know that the town works on a, a tiny agricultural deficit, of course, that gets foodstuffs across from Bostonia proper to the east. So the players, here's my starting map. The players came through this gap here, which turns this way. So it literally does this, right? And then here is Dawn's Hope. And here is the farmlands around Dawn's Hope. And that's that's pretty much it. That's what they have. And they know probably about this much land or thereabouts. And the rest of this is mostly unknown to them. The goal with Dawn's Hope is to create sort of a Wild West vibe. Um, you know, it should, be, it should be big enough to be a functioning base of operations for them like they should be able to buy equipment if they need it and you know have an alchemist or a doctor in town um like that kind of thing right they should be able to get services for adventures here but it needs to be small enough that everybody knows each other and knows everybody else's business i, I think that's sort of important um there should be a stable of recurring npcs that we can you know keep going back to hopefully they're interesting enough um, but yeah, but we want the players to be interacting with the same people week in and week out. Um, I think that's, that's a staple of, of good campaigns typically. Um, it should be a stopping point. So I call it the, the deep space nine effect. So as new people come into the valley, that sets up future events, right? So if a group of prospectors comes into the valley then in a week or two in a game, I can have an event which is, oh, you know, those prospectors, they were captured by goblins. Go go save them, right? That kind of thing. So so the foreshadowing is they come through and the PCs get to interact with them. And then later on, something happens and the, you know, and the PCs are called to action kind of thing. But they already they already know them. They already met them. That, that kind of game. That's sort of what we're trying to get at. Um, so that's that's my hope for that's my my hope for Dawn's Hope, as it were. So yeah, so the caravan comes into Dawn's Hope. There are two gates. There's a north north gate, which is actually a northeast, and a south, which is a southwest gate. North gate and south gate. Um, you know the wagons are are being unloaded, or they're, the the homesteaders are being directed. There's there's a bunch of shield guild soldiers there, uh, sort of directing traffic of all these wagons that have come. Uh, the town doctor, Dr. Jane Holloway, is out there to just check the settlers to make sure they're healthy, not bringing any crazy disease to kill everyone. Um, and then the, the old the sheriff, Captain Thornton, who's the captain of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Guild. But again, the charter states that the S.H.I.E.L.D. Guild effectively, uh, you know, is, 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 uh, it is uh, uh, ordained to... to keep the peace in town, right, and settle disputes, etc. He's there overseeing all of this, making sure everybody gets to where they need to go. Um, so the PCs are free to take care of their business for a little while. Vincent meets up with his manservant, Philip, 
uh, who came earlier to set up the house. He, of course, has set the house up with a barracks for the soldiers um, and a little bit of storage space. You know, knowing that his master is a, you know, a tinkerer and, and minor uh, and a machinist, you know, he has anticipated that we'll need work, that they'll need workspace. And so he does have uh, uh, some extra space, an extra shed effectively for that. Of course, Alphonse introduces him to young Keeley, who, if you remember, Alphonse hired to be his cook. And Philip is obviously not thrilled to have a new trainee to deal with, but does offer to get her set up. Um, Lord Pannock uh, was hired uh, from last week by the Vincents as their the captain of their guard here, um, and so he's gonna uh, he's gonna bed down with the men in the barracks, and. And for a Panock, that's a good deal, right? That That's sort of what they do as a family, since they do not um, own that much. They are frequently uh, in the employ of, of the other families. Um, what else do we got? We got Avery. Avery's looking to make a little bit of pocket money, since he has none, because he is super poor. And so he goes, but he has herbs. He has, he has, he's an herbalist, and he picks some herbs along the way. And he goes and he finds actually the alchemist's uh, uh, shop where the cobra snake man from the south, Sestoth, uh, the cobra alchemist, is there with ovens blazing and open into the shop so that he can generate some amount of heat in this godforsaken weather that, uh, that these mammals uh, are accustomed to. <laughs> so... Grumpy Snake Man Scholar is, is a trope, and, and I'm going with it. So, uh, Sestoth is unfortunately a way better bargainer than Avery is, and Avery sort of gets ripped off a little bit, but does sell and gets enough probably to bed down somewhere. Um, he then sees about getting a bed in the laborer camp. So there are, there are camps here, literally tent camps and sheds and shacks where the day laborers uh, bed down. Uh, Magnus, our mage, visits both taverns, the Muddy Pick, in the laborer camp, uh, sort of, it's just a, it's a dive in the middle of the laborer camp, and the White House, which is in sort of the market, the center market street there, run by Harper Lily White. Uh, he negotiates a bet at the White House. Now, none of these places are actually inns in the traditional sense, um, but Lily figures she can make some day, daily cash, and so will will get him a bed in the loft. And that's the most upscale place that's here, right? This is where the folks that, that you know, that have a, a good steady wage, the the captains and the soldiers, the nobles, etc., would be here. And then only 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 that is good enough for our, our mage uh, Magnus. Father Grimm and Sister Fiona head to the only church in town, and that church is the Church of St. Barbara. And St. Barbara is the patron saint of prospectors and miners. So there's two gods. There's a father and mother. We talked about that last time. Um, the, the Bostonians also worship, uh, put that uh, little W instead of big W, uh, a large array of saints, sort of much, they venerate a large array of saints, much like the Catholics do. Um, St. Barbara is the patron saint of prospectors and miners. Uh, the legend has it that uh, after the mine collapse in Civita, which is in Vincent Barony, by the way, years and years ago, of course, this is way, way long time ago, Barbara wailed and mourned for the dead, and the rest of the village was unable to console her or move her physically from the mouth of the mine entrance. She ultimately died at the entrance of the collapsed mine and said that sometimes you can hear Barbara wailing for her lost men at the entrance of any mine. Um, there's also a small effigy of St. Hubert, and Hubert is the saint of trappers, woodmen, archers, and hunters, and the, uh, the folk that go out in the woods, the trappers and the hunters, do often leave small offerings of arrowheads and, and cure and pelts. Um, and in fact, Sister Fiona, uh, who killed a goat back in the palace for dinner, kept the skin and uh, rolled that up and left that for St. Hubert's, uh, for the effigy. 
So the holy folks here, that's Mother Celia, Water Bear Alice, Father Grimm, Sister Fiona, and the young uh, energetic priest that runs this church, uh, Father Mickelson, um, discuss sort of what is going on here. And so the mother, Celia, tells them that, you know, she had visions. So the, the, the priestesses are largely or defined effectively whether or not they have the rune, the sacred falls of Esther, if they have magic or not. Um, initiates are, are, often, are sometimes called little sisters. They do not have it. They are either in training or they do not possess the willpower or the wherewithal to undergo the trial of the Dark Lake and take the rune. So they're sort of the lowest echelon of, of priestess. The learned sisters are the ones that have the rune. The Altharza are sort of a sideways branch of that, which, and they are warriors, and some of them have magic and some of them don't. Um, but so anyway, the water bearers are a special uh, sect of, of these priestesses. They are plucked from training very, very young when the talent, their, their unique talents are recognized. And then they're trained in this other thing, which is to be able to commune with the water, weirdly enough. And so they can actually cast near permanent or, or, or permanent blessings on bodies of water to purify them and bless them in perpetuity. And they're called water bearers. And they're she, this Alice, she's young. She's like 13 years old. She was just in school. She knows very little of the world, unfortunately, and you know, and and you know, and the mother and the and this uh, this mother superior thinks that she is the key to saving this town. So presumably, the the so so uh, the the mother superior was granted a vision by um, Estra that she came here and. Everyone was sick and or dying because the water was tainted. Now, that's not true, obviously. Everybody here is not sick or dying. Uh, so they decide to test the water. Uh, the, the Sister Fiona casts a spell, which allows her to detect water, but also determine if it's tainted in some way, and it is not tainted. So the Mother Superior is pretty happy, a little wary, but pretty happy that, uh, that they have time to plan and prepare for what is going to lie ahead. Um, in the meantime, uh, the the father, uh, you know, offers his hospitality to the holy party, of course, and offers uh, to to get them. I mean, he doesn't have a lot. He he gives them the rectory effectively, which is is what's what's here, and make sure that they get effectively uh, a bath, like some some kind of receptacle to to bathe, because the priestesses ritually immerse themselves, and that's how they gain their spell levels. So if they exhaust themselves casting spells, they have to immerse in a pure body of water. That could be a river if the water was pure, which in theory it is right now. Um, that, that's how they do it. So being on the road, they can't do that, and so they did it here. Um, so yeah, so everybody sort of spends the day, and they have their little encounters out and about. Some talk to the doctor. They talk to Sesta, the the alchemist. Um, uh, the nobles have their own, you know, set of sort of a mini encounter there. Ultimately, all folks are asked to join Captain Thornton at his residence uh, for dinner this evening, and they'll discuss some business and so on. Right. So, so you got the nobles there. You have the 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 the, the the priests and priestesses, so Father Grimm and Father Mickelson and Sister Fiona. Mother Superior currently, no, I mean, currently they aren't sure that she's in town. Um, obviously, a VIP's in that magical white wagon of, of awesomeness, but, um, but they don't know for sure. So they invite the, the father, the priests, uh, and, and so on. Um, like the engineers. So there's, this place is 
there's four engineers. There's an engineer's lodge here. There's four engineers, three, three uh, like a, a senior, two associates, and a junior engineer that help with all the building and, you know, right, getting everything together. And again, the Vincents and the engineers don't get along because the Vincents largely believe that the engineers do crap work and they don't let them operate in their in their kingdom. Um, engineers there, the scale guild rep's going to go to dinner, the nobles, the holy folk, that kind of thing. Panok is there because he is invited. Uh, you might wonder where Percy is, our th crow thief assassin, and very simply... Uh, his player wasn't there. So we we pretty much, our policy is if you're not there, you're sort of not there, and you just sort of fade off into the background. And when you show up, you sort of magically show up again, and we don't really think about where you were or how to get you there or whatever. We don't have other people play you when you're not there. Um, you just sort of fade off into the distance. The only caveat being if you have, if you're the, you have one unique skill or something that, that the party needs, we we might sort of allow that to, you know, they can use you as like a, they can play your card. Well, if Percy was here, he would pick the lock and you go, okay, good enough. Uh, we'll, we'll roll that kind of thing. Just, just so the game doesn't necessarily get stopped up with, um, you know, with one player having a unique skill for their character and them not being there kind of thing. Now, in this game, we're going to have multiple characters each. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. So they go to dinner. Captain Thornton, um, you know, talks there, but they they have a nice dinner, right? Uh, but and Thornton tells him, "Look, we're going to conduct town business with a a, a moot with a, with a, a, a like a a court, effectively. The nobles will each have a vote. So there's four of them. The captain will have a vote. The merchants and the tradesmen have a single vote." They're probably the most underrepresented for their, their economic power. The engineers will have a vote. The clergy will have a vote. And the homesteaders will have a vote. The homesteaders, well, okay, the homesteaders are most underrepresented because you're talking five to 600 people. Um, but the merchants and tradesmen are probably second. But but nonetheless, they, so that, that's nine votes. Um, so you just get a vote. And I figured that might be a fun... And, and the reason I'm doing this, frankly, is so that there can be an episode or two where rousting up the votes, like gathering the votes is the focus, right? Like what do you have to offer to the homesteaders or what do you have to offer to the to, to the, the engineers to, to get them to go your way when you when it's going to be a five to four vote kind of thing. And that's what I'm looking for. So that's why we set this up. Um, uh, anything pertaining to the town's immediate safety or defense or, or keeping law and order Ultimately, it's up to the captain to approve, um, since that is his job. But, you know, day-to-day -day business, tax rates, or can we put up another tavern, or, right, the, can we have pink flamingos in our yard, whatever. Like, that all goes to this this voting, uh, this, this group here. You bond to the scale guild, takes over the assayer's office. Captain Thornton is not the... He's a little lazy. He's a he wants to just he wants to slow play this, and him having to keep track of all of the different prospectors and where they're at and the claims, he lets Yvonne do that. That's why she's here, and indeed, independent prospectors have come through. Uh, none of them have really struck it rich yet. They found there's certainly evidence of of mineral deposits in those hills and in those mountains. No one has quite, you know found the, the gold dust in the river or anything like that. Um, Captain indicates that the town is mostly safe. There are gaunts and hill trolls in the mountains. Remember, hill trolls are effectively ogres. Gaunts are man-bird creatures that peck you to death with their, with their rock-hard beaks. Um, goblins in the southwest... No sign of the Talak. The Talak are feared, heavily feared, across all of Bostonia, near the mountains. They are effectively man-machine hybrids. They fuse themselves with, with metal, and they fight from de metal demon chariots that are drawn by horses of smoke and flame, pretty much. They are death fantasy bikers. Um, 
but they've seen none of those here. So, so that's good. That's good. So as they're talking about um, where they saw the goblins, so they have the map, at least the, the section of map that I showed you, right? Like this much map. A young guildsman comes in and tells them, hey, there's a disturbance outside of town. So everybody gets up and goes and checks. And it seems like a group of, of guildsmen on patrol are dragging some bodies back. Like they're, they're dot guys' bodies. These soldiers have been trounced. There's like 10 of them. They got their butts kicked. You know, half of them are down, that kind of thing. So as, it's, as it happens, um, as winter broke, uh, the captain realized that he had not saw seen the folk from the Taggart farm. The Taggart farm is pretty much the northwesternmost farm on the river. So it's it's upriver. It's literally here. It's the northwesternmost farm from the town up the river that they have. Um, <clears throat> no one's heard had heard from them. He sent them there. The the the, the the soldiers, they so the, the party starts to help. Of course, they help the injured. The sister has healing magic, uh, so uh, so she can help heal a little bit. The couple of them are medics, and so on. So they spring into action. Of course, um, the doctor also is called in, and she springs into action as well. A couple of them are seriously injured, like their ribs are smashed, like that kind of. It's bad, bad. So you know, asking them what happened. The they they went to check Taggart Farm, which is about two and a half hours away. Each of those hexes is about eight miles ish, so it's almost three. It's three hours away, two and a half, let's say. So they went to Taggart Farm, and they saw nobody. No, the but the fences were broken. You know, the barn door was off, half you know, like busted. The house, the windows were broken. Right, that kind of thing. Um, they didn't see any sign of uh, habitation. Uh, they did see the cows sort of out and about, and they thought, oh, man, these cows must have, you know, broken the fence or, or the barn and wandered down to the river. So they, they did go and try to, they're going to rouse the cows back into like the barn maybe and, and try to barricade it or close it up. As they approached, though, they realized the cows were unnaturally large. Um, and by that, I mean, like, like a truck, kind of, not a, not a semi, but, uh, you know, like they'd have noticed that, but like a pickup truck, like it's, 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 it's one and a half times as big as a cow would be kind of, and then the cows actually cattle charge them aggressively with white eyes, dead white eyes, and they smashed into them and trampled them and held them, you know, and trampled them, right? Um, smashed into them with their with their ton tons of body weight, knocked them down, and when they were down, they stomped them. Um, so obviously, now it's late; it's dark. The group thinks that we're, we should go help, and Lance and Avery decide they're going to go that night. Uh, the rest of the party is like, well, maybe we should wait till you know morning. We just got in. They're nobles, and you're right. And Father Grimm is lazy, so they're like, oh, you know, we could use a good night's sleep. Maybe we just ate. Um, Lance and Avery go now. Frankly, as a GM, not a big fan of that behavior in general. My take is you'd always stick with the party, and if you're not going to stick with the party, you should at least tell the party so that you can at least get that you know a little bit of that back and forth. Like going off and doing stuff by yourself, typically. Doesn't help. What's going to happen? What if, what if you have to fight a bunch of dudes? Or what if you, what if you actually, you know, like, am I going to deal with you for an hour? Right? Don't split the party, typically. Um, now, we already, because we already have a lot of situations. There's eight folks where you're doing one thing, so I'm focused here and then here and then here, right? There's a lot of waiting your turn in this game as it is. So don't, don't exacerbate that by, by leaving. So something that we have to make sure is clear for folks. But it's dark, too. They can't see anything anyway. So they get up there. They can't see really Jack. It is a dark night. There's some minimal moonlight, but not a ton. And so 
No, I would have loved if the whole party went there at night. That would have been creepy as as all get out. But it, but it wasn't. It was just these two. So Lance's horse starts to get nervous as he sniffs the air. He smells something and gets gets huffy, right? And indeed, Lance hears like a huffing and stomping uh, down by the river. Like, a, right, something's pawing the ground, like clawing and huffing. And like a slobbery rabies right there there's drooling on Avery sneaks up to the house and he also hears animal noise but he hears like a growling and a grunting and a snapping as though like a, a dog is is being held at bay and trying to snap at something and he hears a deep human voice going shh puppy quiet but a rumbling deep voice too deep too rumbling too big and and they both decide, <laughs> and these are my two sons, they both decide at the same time, maybe, maybe we should go. <laughs> maybe, maybe dad's trying to tell us something. I don't know. <laughs> so, they head back and report their findings. They, and now I did dig with them and made it hard for them to get back into town. <laughs> um, so, the party gathers the next morning. Lance and Avery report their findings. The party knows it's going to meet something bad there. They figure it might be a troll or something, um, right? A troll attack. But there's the the death, the zombie death cows. So, so they go and they investigate Taggart Farm. Um, they get to Taggart Farm, and there is primarily there's the house, there's a, a, a barn. There's, of course, the fields and the fence, which is all busted. They can see that. There are some chicken pens. There's a post with a donkey who's sitting there eating. <laughs> Just Donkey is totally nonplussed by the entire thing. He doesn't care. He's good. Um, chickens are mostly, they're not big. They're not giant chickens, but they haven't been watered in quite a while. And so they're, they're hurting, those chickens. Um, and they're still in a pen. So they leave the cattle. Well, they check the barn. The barn's a mess, bloody mess. So it looks like some of the cattle went nuts and, and crushed the other ones, slamming them into the, the walls of the barn. There's a, a, a human farmer, a young farmer, uh, trampled. Uh, nothing's alive in the barn. You know, the, the beast lore trackers or whatever, they check around, and it looks like this poor dude was, like, stomped, like something held him to the ground and he was just stomped. The dead cattle's eyes are white. They are drooly. Um a couple of them while they're doing the out investigation, they sneak to the house and they see a huge nine like a nine foot tall dude holding a huge dog by the collar. The dog is large, both have white eyes, the dog is snapping, trying to bite the man's face off. The man is holding the dog and telling him to, to shush, right? Just like he was last night, hours ago. Same thing. At some point, both the dog and the giant see the characters sneaking up. Fiona, I think. Um, and they get up. And the dude snaps off like a big hunk of table leg and holds the rest of the table like a shield in front of him, like with no effort. He just picks up the, 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 the table, um, and they fight. Uh, it's, it's not a bad fight. The dude is big but slow, so no defense. Offense is decent enough, and he does a ton of damage. The party, though, I mean, again, so you have seven folk. Well, and, and so the other thing, and this is something to, to talk about, Patrick Falloran does go with them this morning, um, and why does Patrick go? Patrick goes because Patrick, so Patrick is the Falloran younger son. Um, he is, he's been essentially given this grant, right? This gift to go and, and seek his fortune out here on the frontier. He plans to do so, but he is not as interested in, say, the Vincents in Enterprise. Um, and even not as, as interested as his staff is. His staff is very interested in setting up a business here, and they're going to do it. But Patrick 
is interested in adventuring in the new world. So he's all about adventuring, like being a knight. Um, and he is a little too wholesome and, of course, doesn't like the Vincents and a little bit full of himself. And so it pisses, and he's a little better than them. And so he pisses them off a bit. Uh, but, you know, not he's not so much better that he's saving the party all the time, right? No, but he is just a little bit better. And so it just tweaks the Vincents enough that it makes me happy. Um, <laughs> uh, but he's going to. So he's there. So the thing you have to realize is there's eight PCs. Well, eight characters. One NPC and, and seven PCs against two. And no matter how big you make that guy, the action economy is is gravely on the side of, of the, the characters. Um, you would have to give this dude multiple actions around. And typically, you I do that with boss creatures. They get multiple actions um you know you know they, they might get three or four actions in a given turn um spread out amongst the party set so so this guy is big and he manages to land a hit or two but nothing really that actually nothing lands um, uh, well and he they are taken down but in the meantime the cows notice the clamor of battle and they head up and so the PCs are like fighting in the, the yard and the cows look and then they start to charge and everybody panics because there's about six of these or something or five. I don't know how many I said were, were in for the fight. And he, they take six cattle. They're terrified. <laughs> so, so, and they did a good thing, I thought. So what they did was... um. The ones that could get up got up onto the roof. So a couple of them have climb, right? Uh, I think Fiona was, uh, was so so I think Fiona gets on the roof and Avery gets on the roof, right? A couple of them just manage to get to the roof. The rest of them get inside the house. Now there is a hole in the wall where uh, the dude busted out. Uh, but still, even so, the house does provide some protection from the cows, and they're not going to charge all six. You can't get six trucks through this hole, maybe one at a time. And so the cows charge. Uh, two or three of the party get up on the roof. The rest of the party get uh, inside and sort of get around that kitchen, that hole in the kitchen wall, and get themselves ready to fight. And so one cattle comes through, and they start to, right, they hold it back with their with their weapons, and they they. They damage it pretty badly. Um, Fiona gets this great shot with her <clears throat> with her bow, and she does a fair bit of damage, which actually wounds the cow. She hits it in the head, and it's a mortal wound, and it drops it in one shot, which is pretty amazing, actually. And then Lance, I thought, actually did a very clever thing too. Lance used his horse, and he charged the cows and got two of them to chase him, and then he took off. And let them chase him and took them out of the combat. So right there, three of them were out of the combat almost instantaneously. And you had just three left. And, you know, the party then damaged the one and he fled. And then there was two left. And at that point, we called it. Uh, and and, and we we'll, and we sort of figured that Lance, you know, since he took himself out of the fight for these two cows, he was assumed to have tired them out or run, run them out, right? And, and at that point, it was late enough to... To, to, to end it, pretty much. So they decided to take the donkey. Um, the chickens were mostly a lost cause. Um, but the, the, they did take the, uh, the taggart uh, donkey. The farmer, so all the bodies in the house, the, the wife and the children, dead, mutated with the eyes. Um, they, uh, they, they cast the detect water again up, up river, like they did, and find that the water is poisoned and contaminated. And, you know, since the donkey hadn't been watered in, like, almost uh, near a week, he seemed to be fine. So, party heads back, gives their report. Immediately, what, what happens is, you know, the captain gets the remainder of his men, splits them up to go to the other farmsteads and, and report on what's happened. Make sure everybody knows 
Uh, the engineers and the rest of the town folk collect water because the thought is this thing is whatever it is is coming downstream and it just hasn't reached them yet and they don't know how long they have so they're going to collect as much water as, as possible in however they can possible mother cilia then appears with alice tells the captain thornton her theory that this is a contamination caused by upriver and that the water bearer here needs to be taken upriver and she needs to cast her blessing at the headwaters to save the town. That's where they gather the group to then they're going to head upriver. That's that's it. They're going to throw the ring into Mount Doom, but it's going to be a 13-year-old into the water. <laughs> so so um that's the plan. Um that's the plan, I think. What we're going to do at that point, we're going to call this is that's this episode. That was the night uh, at, at gaming as well. So I think that's this episode. The next episode, they gather and they head up, uh, up river and we do a little bit of wilderness uh, walking. So they're going here. So this is where they're at. They're going all up, up, up like this. This is where they're going to head next episode. And that's it. So I think that's uh, that's enough for tonight. I do appreciate your indulging me, and uh, we'll see you on at the. Th we'll see you in episode three. Good night.